a British subject in a way, because he was born in Hong Kong, educated in Hong Kong. Then he went for further studies in the uh, United Kingdom. And from there on, he moved to Australia. And from Australia, he was recruited by NTU. So he's a professor of education. He's a cognitive psychologist interested in learning and memory and education and all those things which are, I would say, essentially important for Singapore and Singapore future, Singapore's future in this field. And I think who is, who will talk a lot about this sort of, uh, the uniqueness of this place, with special regard to education, learning, and memory, and related issues will be carried today. Thank, Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, everyone, for staying to the, to the end. Um, when everyone asked me where I'm from, because um, um, I often show up, um, well, how much detail do you want to know? So um, I'm sure there's an experience here about many of you. Now, um, I'm from the National Institute of Education. In the last few years, we've been doing some research, looking at character development, and looking at how we can help children who are not performing as well as we expect them to. So today, I'm going to um, share some of the work that I've been doing in the last uh, over a decade now, um, looking at the cognitive underpinnings of mathematical achievement. We've been doing a variety of work, um, and some of you here have um, uh, shared in doing some of that work. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on a set of behavioral studies that look at the correlate of mathematical achievement, and uh, I'll also look at how we can help improve children's working memory, executive functioning, and to see whether that can help improve math achievement. Um, there's also a set of imaging study that, um, that we did a little while ago. Uh, I don't think I'll have time to look at that, but um, if, if we do, I'll, I'll say a few words about that briefly. Now, um, so I'll start off looking at the relation of working memory, executive functions, and academic performance, and then I'll focus on the development of executive functioning, and then finally to... Oh, sorry. And then um, I'll look at um, our attempt to improve updating capacity. Now, um, first of all, looking at math performance in Singapore, uh, many of you will know that Singapore has performed very well in international comparisons, both in um, the team's series of study in the last uh, three iterations, as well as in uh, the program for international student assessment. But despite that, that um, high level performance, around 5.5% of each cohort still have some difficulties in performance each year. Um, these children are usually diagnosed in the first year of schooling and are given special support at the school setting. Now, we are particularly interested in these children and also performance more globally. We're interested in finding out what are the drivers, what are the primary causes of individual differences in performance. And uh, when we look at the, the literature a little while ago now, we classify the contributing factors into two uh, camps. One is on looking at system-based variation. So um, societal expectation is known to be very important, parental expectation, um, the effort and the quality of teachers are also known to be very, very important. But on the individual level, we also know that um, social and motivational factors could be important. Motivation usually um, accounts for about five to six percent of variation. Um, biological factors are also particularly important. So for example, in Williams syndrome, we know that children uh, with Williams syndrome tend to have difficulties with um, the numeric comparison in particular. But what we have been interested in are some of the cognitive variables, in particular uh, working memory. Now, um, I have to thank Annabelle for talking about working memory earlier, um, um, but I have to caution you that the way in which we, we use working memory uh, is somewhat different. So uh, let me just, just define what I mean by working memory here. So these are two examples of working memory at work. Um, I don't know if some of you have heard of this, this um, comedy called Yes Minister. Um, it's based on the British Civil Service and one of the main characters is known to, to love very long sentences 
And this is an uh, excerpt of one of the sentences. I, I couldn't fit the whole <laughs> sentence on. Um, you'll notice that each word by itself is not particularly difficult. But by the time you get halfway through that page, you have to go back and look at what that means. So um, comprehension, speech comprehension in particular, has a temporal element to it. Not only do we have to be able to hook onto what we understand, our long-term memory, we also have to be able to combine what's in our long-term memory with the new information that is coming in. So it really is about, um, comprehension is really about combining new information with old information and making sense of it. So there's a storage component, but there's also a processing component as well. And that usage of both processing as well as storage is what makes working memory working. Right? Another example of working memory at work is mental arithmetic. So we have two simple addition uh, problems there, uh, 259 plus 36. If you just work it through in your, in your head, um, the kind of processes you'll go through is, okay, 9, nine plus 6, uh, 15, I have to remember, I have to regroup, one carryover, the second one, 5 plus 3, okay, it's 8. Okay, it's not just 8, right? I have to remember there was a 1 from the first one. So you have to remember the partial solution, and you have to remember the original question, especially if I take this away, and then you have to put everything together. So again, it's a very good example of working memory at work. You have to be able to access your long-term numeric number bonds, and you also have to remember the partial solution puts everything together in your working memory workspace. Right? So it's not just about mnemonic, it's not just about short-term memory, it's about working with the content of your short-term memory. Now there are a large number of theories of working memory. There are those that are more biologically driven, there are those that are um, more symbolic, and there are also computational models of working memory. I won't bore you with all of them. Um, suffice it to say that in, um, in the last decade or so, one well, of the most popular model is that of Alan Badley's and Graham Hitch's model. This was modified in um, 2000, um, as Annabelle has um, told you earlier. There are several components in it. There's a central executive, which is almost like an attentional resource manager. Um, there are slave, so-called slave systems, um, the episodic buffer, chronological loop, and the visual spatial sketch pad, and these are your traditional short-term memory store. Um, it's the kind of things that one would use if I give you my telephone number and ask you to go out, make that phone call um, in, in the payphone outside, you'll just rehearse it, um, and that's your, your chronological loop. And down below, is the um, long-term memory representation of the kind of information that one would be accessing. So this is the um, driving model that we have been using. And um, Bentley and others, in particular Akira uh, Miyaki, have been focusing on the content of that central executive. And they've argued that one can focus on this central executive more by focus, by, by fragmenting it into different components and, and uh, different specialized functions. So um, there are three domains of executive functions that folks have been talking about. One is called updating, which is um, about replacing old information with new. So if you can um, imagine a situation where you have to remember a series of telephone numbers or a shopping list, right? And then you mentally tick off those that you have done and you refresh your memory. So that's an example of updating. Um, another function that's often talked about, and in the first talk this morning, uh, we've talked about the importance of switching and being able to be uh, mentally go from one set of functions to another. So that's another very important executive functioning, executive function that folks have talked about. Um, and it's really about being able to use different strategies and being able to mentally switch between strategies fluently. And the third one that I'm very interested in is inhibition, being able to, to resist, resist um, um, the interfering effect of information that we don't, don't need. So if I just stop talking for a couple of seconds and you attend to the environment, 
you can hear the air con, the air gushing out, but you haven't noticed that before, right? And if I stop again, then you can hear your neighbor writing away, and after a while, it gets a bit annoying. You know, you just kind of hope that the, the person next to you will, will stop moving and just sit still for a few, few seconds. But as an adult, you become very good at doing that kind of inhibitory function. So imagine you're a six-year-old. You're going to school for the first time. And for those of you who know of the local schools, oftentimes they're not air conditioned, they're open plan, and you have the lawn mowers going on outside, you have the next classroom going on. And the first time you visit, it's a wonder that anyone can focus at all. There's just so much going on. So one of the major, major things that kids have to do is to learn to do school to be able to inhibit information that is not necessary and, and that's distracting. And um, we know there are individual differences in that, and one of the things we're interested in looking at is how that impacts <laughs> on achievement. So um, in the last uh, few years, we've been looking at the relation between working memory, updating in particular, and math achievement. Um, my colleague, Rebecca Bu, has done some of the seminal work in this area, and she found that um, if we know the capacity of the central executive, we can predict early math performance, this math performance in kindergarten, very well. Um, it tends to, tends to explain about 25 to about a uh, third of uh, variance in performance. And Gathico and Pickering have found that standardized working memory scores collected with children in the UK were able to predict children's academic standing in math performance against standardized math performance with an accuracy of 83%. So this is talking about parts of failure. So uh, working memory scores tend to do better than sc traditional scores of intelligence in making these kind of explanatory um, um, predictions. Now, um, what we have done was focusing on slightly older children in, so um, going back to, this is 2003, I think it was, um, Back in those days, Singapore had a streaming examination conducted at the end of grade four. And children who were uh, deemed worthy were, were um, streamed to one particular um, set of the education streams, and those who are having difficulties will be streamed to um, another stream that, that uh, receives special, curric uh, special curriculum and they're given special help. But much of, that much of those decisions uh, back in those days were made based on academic standing alone. What we wanted was to have a measure that gives us more insight on the children's potential. Now, measures of intelligence is an obvious, obvious choice, but there are also folk beliefs about intelligence that are, that are not always um, well appreciated. So we wanted something that is less, less contaminated, if you like, and these working memory measures uh, may fit the bill. So we did a couple of studies. Um, in the first study, we simply look at a multifaceted definition of working memory, correlated that with academic performance, and we found that um, the working memory measures explained about 25% of, of academic performance. In the second study, what we did was we expanded that definition of working memory into different facets of executive functioning, and we found that updating, which is very closely linked with working memory capacity, was um, amongst the three domains the best predictor of performance. Again, explaining about 25% uh, of, of uh, performance. Now, um, ours were not the, the only study to find this correlational uh, relationship, but we were a little bit concerned um, uh, and also encouraged. We were encouraged in that well, there's such a strong relation between working memory capacity or updating capacity and math performance. Can we help improve children's math performance by improving updating capacity? Um, we didn't want to jump straight into intervention because much of the findings back in those days were, were correlational in nature. Um, there was, I think, one study that was experimental in nature, but it was done with adults. So we did one study in which we um, used a suppression algorithm, uh, a suppression paradigm, to 
to reduce children's access to working memory capacity. And we found that by doing that, the performance uh, did indeed um, uh, got, the, it got worse as compared to when, when they just simply performed a second task that wasn't as working memory intensive. So we had some, we had some experimental data that suggests that this relationship is not just correlational, but it's of a experimental, or it is of a, a causal uh, nature. Um, but we were also concerned that, well, if one were to do intervention, when is the best time, when is the best time to do it? Um, there was some data from the kindergarten years. Um, in fact, much of, the, much of the studies available back in those days were conducted with kindergartners and primary one, primary schoolers. Our studies were conducted with slightly older children, 10 years of age, in primary five, but there simply wasn't much longitudinal data on this relation between working memory and academic performance. So we did a, a long-term longitudinal study to find out whether there is stability in this relation between working memory, executive functioning, and math performance. Um, once we started planning this study, um, we realized how difficult it was going to be. Because, as you know, math is not always about just addition and subtraction. As children get older, what constitutes mathematics changes. Uh, simply, um, in addition to that, what counts as executive function also changes as children matures. And when we had a look at the literature, what we found was that there was really quite a lot of differences in terms of the structure of executive functioning across different age groups. So um, with adults and older children, what has been found was, as suggested by uh, Akira Miyake, uh, a three-factor structure consisting of inhibition, working memory, and shifting. Whereas when we look at slightly younger children, um, perhaps 10-year-olds, so children in primary schools, generally we find a two-factor structure. But whether it is working memory and some generalized executive functions, or inhibition and some other generalized inhibition, there's a lot of variety in the literature. When we look at even younger children, so children in preschool, what we tend to find is a unitary structure. So if we use the same kind of task, what we find with younger children is that these different tasks would load onto the same latent structure, suggesting that, that, that for very young children, there's very little psychometric differentiation between the different tasks. So these data um, from different studies suggest that there are developmental changes in the structure of executive functions, and there's a process of differentiation that occurs with age. Now, um, as I was saying before, oops, sorry, I think the button got stuck. Um, as I was saying before, um, the nature of math also changes from uh, simple numeracy to arithmetic, geometry, to algebra, to later on in the grade in uh, secondary school, looking at calculus. So um, what we did was we designed a cohort sequential study in which we um, examined the nature of executive functioning from kindergarten to secondary school. And we also examined the relationship between executive function and math performance. The main question of interest was whether the structure changed. And we, uh, both the structure of mathematics as well as executive functions and we also wanted to find out whether there was stability in the relation between the cognitive variables and achievement. We used what's called a cohort sequential design. So we started off with four cohorts of children, five, seven, nine, and 11, and we tested the same group of children once per year for four years. So at the end of the study, we ended up having data from children that stretch from five years of age to 14 years of age. And we had about 673 kids. Um, each child was 
tested quite extensively. Um, these were the constructs that, were, that we were particularly interested in, executive functioning, as defined in terms of inhibition, updating, and switching. We're interested in mathematics, uh, both in terms of basic numeracy to the understanding of math patterns and algebra. We had an extensive battery of, um, of tests. Each child were interviewed for about uh, five and a half to six hours, not in one sitting. Uh, with kindergartners, we spread it out over about six days. And for the oldest, oldest kids, we usually got it done in about uh, five days. So we separated the various measures into five sets, and we had measures of the same construct at each time point. So we were able to do um, quite a lot of longitudinal estimation with the data. Now, let me just give you a sense of the kind of instruments we use to measure the various constructs. So in terms of updating, this is our, our perhaps one of our best tasks for measuring um, updating capacity. It's a running span task. Um, we show children one card at a time, and then we ask them at the end of the trial, which was the, let's say, the last two cards that they saw. Now, um, why is this a working memory or updating task? It's an updating task because you don't know when the task is going to end. So you first see a bear, you see a cow, you see a frog, and the list keeps going. What constitutes the last two changes every time you see a new card, right? So you need to keep refreshing your memory as to what the last two is. And also, you don't know when it's going to end. So you just have to keep going all the time, right? Um, in terms of the inhibition task, we use um, something called the flanker task. In this task, children were asked to focus on, they were asked to focus on um, the direction that the central fish points at. And what has been found in the literature is that when all the fish point to the same direction in a congruent trial, um, reaction time tends to be faster. And when they're in different directions, they tend to be slower. So one could obtain an estimate of inhibitory costs by looking at differences between the incongruent and the congruent trials. It's very similar to the task that was used um, in the first talk this morning. And, sorry, this. Um, with the switch task, um, we use a rotational task in which children were presented with a uh, bigram, and each bigram is uh, consisted of a picture and a number. And uh, children, when the biogram appears at the top, the children were asked whether the picture contained an animal. So sometimes it's an animal, sometimes it's a, it's a car or a truck. When it's at the bottom, um, they were asked whether the picture contained a number. So they have to be able to switch uh, fluently in making those kind of decisions. And again, we're looking at, at trials in, that consist of a switch versus trials that don't consist of a switch, and we calculate a, a, a switch efficiency uh, measure out of this, this task. Now, our standardized math task looks something like this. The content of the task varies with age. So you can see for kindergartners, it's relatively simple. It really is just a simple numeracy task, whereas when it gets to uh, secondary schools, it uh, involves exponentials as well as um, uh, some calculus as well, which I'm shown here. So, what did we find? Um, okay, I'll, I'll stick to the mouse from now on. <laughs> it keeps jumping. Um, okay, what, what did we find? Um, in terms of of working memory or updating capacity, what we found was that there was an increase with age. And um, even with the, older, with the older children, there was still an increase. Even with the oldest age groups, um, this increase was significant. And what I uh, didn't point out earlier was that for each of the constructs, we had multiple tasks to index that, um, that construct to improve reliability. Also, it allows us to do uh, latent level analysis of the data as well. With the uh, flanker task, um, the data there represents simple subtraction of the 
incongruence and the incongruent tasks. And what you find is that there's a general decrease with age of inhibitory costs. With the switch cost, there's also a general decrease, although um, some tasks were performing much better than others. So for the picture symbol task that I showed you before, there was a general decrease of switch cost with age, but uh, with the flanker task, that really didn't work very well at all. It was um, hitting uh, bottom right from, almost from the beginning. Now, how do we model the data? We use a technique called uh, confirmatory factor analysis uh, with a twist. Um, what's, what is generally used in literature, in the literature is to subtract um, switch trials from non-switch trials or incongruent trials from congruent trials. But what we know uh, from these kind of subtraction scores is that they tend to have very, very low reliability. Uh, in fact, even when the congruent condition has a reliability of, let's say, 0.9, uh, when you take the subtraction, usually the reliability drops down to about 0.4 if you're lucky. So what we did instead was to use a uh, residualized approach in which we took the incongruent trials or the non-switch trials out of the picture by using a regression, and then we took the residuals of those scores in order to form a latent, fracture, fracture, uh, a late, latent structure. So this way allows us to get at the conceptual meaning of, of a cost associated with inhibition or a cost associated with switching without having to take a subtraction. We took a, a residual uh, measure instead. So um, using this approach longitudinally, what we found was that with most of the age groups, with most of the younger age groups, what we got was a two-factor structure. We could identify a factor, uh, a factor that's associated with working memory, and we can identify another factor that's associated with inhibition and switching, but combined. So it's a generalized executive function, functioning measures consisting of measures from the inhibition and the switch tasks. It wasn't until 14 years of age that we got a very clear, very well-separated set of uh, functions that was clearly differentiated into updating, switching, and inhibition. So what these findings show is that the development in terms of the factor structure of executive functioning takes a long time. Differentiation is slow. When we get to the teenage years, we see some differentiation, it jumps around a little bit from two factor to three factor, but it wasn't until 14 years of age that we got this firm separation into the three factor that we see in adults. Um, so this is what I said earlier. <coughs> so going to the question of, so how, how how does working memory uh, relate to academic performance with time? Uh, is there stability with time? In order to look at this, we um, have so far only extracted the working memory and updating measure to form the latent structure with those three measures. And we took the result from the standardized math task as a criterion measure, and we looked at um, uh, the stability of this relation across time. And what we found was that, by and large, um, with the exception of perhaps kindergarten, um, the working memory measures predicted academic performance in terms of math very, very well. There was a peak at uh, P1 and P2, and these are regression betas, um, whereas for the rest of the for the rest of the age grade, uh, the relation was still quite strong. We also submitted the same data to a set of autoregressive auto or Markov chain analyses. The previous analysis separated the data into discrete age groups. So we looked at the K2 data by itself, we looked at the P1 data by itself, P2 data by itself that basically replicated the cross-sectional data that one usually sees in the literature. So what this set of analysis does 
is to take advantage of the longitudinal nature of the data. So we, um, we regressed performance in one age group to the next age group to the next age group. Now, a very interesting set of findings came out. In kindergarten, what we found was that what is the most important is working memory capacity. In terms of performance in math, it doesn't matter so much what you have done in the previous year in terms of your math performance. But what is important is your working memory capacity. It seems that in those early years, what really drives the performance in math is how, how much oomph you have in your cognitive system. Right? Whereas if we compare that to later on, in these are with the oldest children, what we found here was the reverse set of findings. What we found with the oldest children was that working memory capacity didn't count that much anymore. When children are older, what you have learned previously is much more important. And I suppose it makes some intuitive sense as well. If we look at calculus, if you haven't done your algebra very well, it's going to be difficult to, to, do, to do calculus. Whereas with uh, things like arithmetic, um, numeracy, if you, if you didn't, for some reason, you know, didn't, didn't go to kindergarten, you can probably still pick up stuff as you go along with your vocabulary. But your ability and the speed with which you can pick up stuff would depend on your, amongst other things, working memory capacity. So, um, we're, we're quite um, happy with this sense of, of finding. And what this suggests to us is that if we are going to look at working memory improvement or intervention of some sort, then we should do it when children are younger, perhaps at T1 and T2. Um, I won't go into the, all these details, but let me move on to, to um, the intervention now. So our previous findings um, show that there is a strong relation between working memory updating and math performance. We found that this relation between the cognitive capabilities and um, math performance peak at the early primary school years, whereas at secondary schools, um, there is a concurrent relation, but the predictive relation basically drops off. So if we are to do intervention, we really should focus on the early years. And this is what we did. Now, um, when we looked around the literature, there, there are already available some working memory interventions. Uh, one of the most well-known one is called uh, COGMAD from the Karolinska Institute. And um, a number of studies have been done. Most of them were done with uh, clinical samples, but there were some, uh, a handful of studies that were done with, with normally achieving children. But the findings are, are quite uh, difficult to get on equivocal, and also the program itself is very expensive. I think in Singapore dollars, it's about 2,500 Per, um, per child for about 20 sessions, and there's also a relation between socioeconomic status and working memory capacity as well. So um, the children who are most likely to, to need that kind of intervention are not likely to be able to come from families that can afford them. So we wanted to design something that will be more easily accessible to children, um, and in terms of the design parameters, um, we wanted to focus on updating rather than working memory per se, because there's some data that suggests that working, uh, that updating does do a slightly better job as compared to working memory. Um, we didn't want to, we didn't want the intervention to involve any math content per se, because what we want to test in, in this uh, first instance is whether improving working memory improve math performance. If we were to build in math content, and, and some of the commercially available packages do have math content in it, uh, the problem with that approach is, is that one could simply come back and say, well, of course the kids are getting better. You're getting them to do more math, right? Mm -hmm. So we wanted to avoid that. Um, in terms of the gameplay, um, there's a lot of 
data from the literature showing that an adaptive algorithm does better than a non-adaptive algorithm. What that means is that um, um, children should, the, the gameplay or the training should get progressively more difficult, but the rate at which difficulty increases should be dependent upon the participant's uh, success or failure. Um, the intervention should be fun and engaging, and we wanted to use visual stimuli that discourage uh, verbal recoding as well. Again, um, we want to be able to, to say something more specific about working memory improvement rather than verbal abilities. So we ended up designing uh, seven games. Um, this is the format of one set of games. So we'll have uh, um, some introduct introductory instructional games. Um, this is uh, one of our first games called the Post Bear in which this bear here is posted to an alien planet. Um, the post bear is very dedicated to, to his task and just want to get those uh, letters into the mailboxes and not particularly interested in interacting with the, with the locals. So um, when, the lo when the locals come along, um, the post bear can either push them away, slide underneath, jump on top, um, there are several, several options. Um, and the training part comes at the end. After a while of playing with the game, a little triangle comes up, and this is a sign for the participants to start remembering. Right? This is where the real updating comes in. And the children have to remember the identity of the last alien, the second last alien, or as the game becomes more difficult, the last three aliens. So this is very similar to the kind of testing that we do with children. It's basically a running span uh, algorithm. Let me just show you what, what it looks like. one more time. So the post bear is walking along. The warning sign is already up, right? So the children will know to remember the shape of the, of the alien. And the child is asked to remember what was the last one and what's the second last. And it's quite... Go ahead. We, we, give them, we give them a participation prize, um, but at, um, we, don't, we don't give a, a prize for having the high. Actually, did we give a prize for the highest scorer in the class? No, actually, we plan to do that in the second round. Yeah. Um, that's really quite happening because we've got many uh, So they, they did have scores, but they, was, they couldn't exchange the, the scores for, for real prize later on. Can you explain the process? Do you have any software components, like I'm better than the others? <laughs> Do they have any what? Like a social, like, uh, like a rank. Right. So you could show them you did better than other people, like, could you do this kind of not, not that Not that they, they say, no. no. I mean, that's, that's something that, um, that one should look at. We, we didn't want to, to make it too competitive at this stage. Um, one reason being the system is already quite competitive. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that was one of our concerns because um, um, in, in our study, what we did was we ran this game and we also ran the commercially available one, which is uh, Cogmat. And Cogmat has a relatively, has a larger motivational element in it. And we want to be able to differentiate those two. Um, and at this stage, we want, just wanted to find out, well, does it work without the, without the motivation? 
And that's something that's in the pipeline. So, thank you. so we had, um, we ended up developing seven games, um, and the seven games were, were somewhat similar, um, but we based the seven games in, in um, we based them from, on two paradigms. Uh, one is the post bear paradigm, in which they see different things coming out, and they have to remember the last two, the last three. And then we have another set of games that's based on the keep track, what's what we call the keep track paradigm. So um, if I can um, use this as an example, this is based on a kind of food court example. And we have a child here who is very hungry. Um, and the child will be asked to, to get Western food, to get um, Asian food, fruits, or uh, something else. And they have to remember the last exemplar of each category. So when the game first begins, there's only one category. For example, Asian food. Right? And there's not much to update. This is always just the last one. But as the game becomes progressively more difficult, we increase the number of categories. So um, when there are two um, uh, categories, there'll be Asian food and, let's say, Western food. And then the updating starts to kick in, because you have to remember not only the last exemplar in one category, you also have to update your, your mind in terms of the exemplar in the other category as well. So you can imagine when it gets to four categories, it becomes quite, quite difficult. There's a lot to update. So these are the um, other games we had, again, based on the uh, continuous uh, running span paradigm and the keep track paradigm. Um, as I was saying before, uh, not only did we run uh, this set, which is um, kind of the, home, the homemade games, we also used a commercially available set of um, uh, intervention as well, um, the COPMAT intervention, which we just kind of got straight from from the box, so to speak. Um, this is what it looks like. It's very visual, spatial, uh, visual, spatially um, uh, orientated. So in this, in this game, different numbers will light up, and then the children have to remember um, the sequence in which the different numbers light up and to re reproduce it later on. Now, so main question was whether um, Intervention worked, and uh, if they did work, uh, which whether one did better than the other, and whether um, there was improvement in both working memory updating as well as in math achievement. Now um, we had um, 87 uh, participants, and we had a uh, number of conditions with a up updating condition, COMAD, as well as an active control condition. In the active co control condition. Um, the children play very similar games as compared to the experimental games. But what we took out was the little triangle, and what we took out was also the remembrance phase. So they simply played the pushing, jumping, and um, um, the gameplay part of the intervention, but there was no remembrance, no actual training. And there was a business as usual control as well. Um, there was a large number of um, measures that we administered both in pre-test and post-test. And what we found was that um, on one of the visual spatial working memory tasks, which is very closely associated with the material used in COGMAT training, there was a very, very impressive improvement on COGMAT. So the blue line is the COGMAT condition. Um, this is the pre-test, as you can see, no differences in pre-test performance. Immediate post-test, this was after um, 20 sessions. No, 20, 25 sessions, um, and this is a six-month delay. So at the immediate post-test, COMRAD did wonderfully well, um, but uh, after cessation of training, it basically went back down, and at post-test, there, no, there were no significant differences. And this was the only condition on which there were significant differences uh, for, for COMRAD. For our intervention, um, we found that on the animal updating task, which is the animal card one that I showed you before, again, quite closely associated with the intervention uh, medium, 
what we found was that at um, the delay post-test, the intervention is significantly better than the other conditions. Now, um, so not bad, but not great either, right? Um, we wait, basically what we found was that the training improved performance on tasks that are very closely associated with, with training. But it really didn't generalize it to um, other working memory tasks. And certainly, there was no improvement on the math task either. And that's generally the, the result that has been found in the literature. There is immediate um, transfer to tasks that are very close to the training stimuli, but there is no transfer to wider academic now this uh, this finding is really quite quite surprising because um, given the close correlational findings and also the experimental findings relating working memory and academic performance, one would reasonably expect a much better set of results. So why is there not better transfer? Um, there are several possibilities. One is that the training is just rubbish and there's nothing to do with the concept per se. It's just that we didn't didn't do very well in designing the intervention. That's, that's one possibility. Um, another possibility, and probably a much more um, sanguine one, is that perhaps working memory is not something that is trainable. Um, what we found in our longitudinal study is that even though there are significant individual differences in working memory and updating capacity, in terms of the rate of growth, there was no individual across 10 years age range. So people start off at different points at the beginning of assessment, but they all grow at about the same rate across the same age, age, age groups. Um, so it's still a possibility, um, but then there are, there are a number of studies that have shown training effects. So we're not prepared to kind of give up on it yet because there is a mix of both positive findings as well as negative findings. Now, other factors that may uh, come into play is, is dosage. Um, in, our, in our study, what we found was that children who were more successful during training also did better later on, suggesting that there is a dosage effect. Um, but that dosage effect was not associated with um, going back to the motivational uh, question, um, uh, COMED does a lot more one-to-one -one coaching, and perhaps that's an important factor when it comes to this kind of training. But then we also question whether, well, is it really the coaching, the attention that children get, or is it really the working memory and updating um, uh, intervention per se? So um, that's all I want to say about the uh, working memory and uh, math performance stuff. Um, I've got just two more slides. Um, and I just want to outline some remaining questions that we are going to address and how we can place this within a somewhat larger context. Um, one of the things that we, we want to look at, um, perhaps particularly from a, from a uh, neuroimaging perspective, is what leads to differences in factor differentiation. So what we've found in our behavioral findings is that um, there is factor differentiation across age groups. Um, and some of those um, uh, changes are quite marked. So we're talking about going from unitary executive functioning structure to a bifactor model to a trifactor model. Right? Um, what prompts these changes? And we're reasonably certain that there are individual differences in the rate of progression as well. What are the factors that relate to these different rates of progression? Um, the other issue that I'm quite interested in is the role of inhibition. Now, I'm sure all, all of us have, have this experience of reading a page of, of text and then 20 minutes later, we find that we're still reading the same page. Um, very frustrating. Um, and other things just keep popping into our mind. You know, we just can't focus on the damn page. <laughs> but 
this is basically inhibition, right? Being able to resist interfering information. One would have thought that this ability to resist interfering information will be very important when it comes to academic performance. If you're able to do that better, if you're able to get through that page faster, understand your material better, and get to the end a bit better. So there should be a fairly strong relation between inhibitory efficiency and academic performance. But yet, um, study after study have found that that correlation tends to be relatively small. So my question is, well, you know, inhibition is important both in theory as well as in kind of everyday um, experiences. Um, why do we not find a stronger relation? Is it that we are measuring different aspects of inhibition? Um, the literature shows that there are different domains of inhibition. Have we just targeted our work at the wrong kind of inhibition? Um, is it the tools that we're using that's, that's a problem? So I think that's one area that needs quite a bit more work. And looking at a larger context um, within the National Institute of Education and uh, to, to a smaller extent, in conversation with uh, medical school as well, um, we have talked about how we can place some of this work within a larger context. And one way in which we thought um, uh, we might be able to do it, and in a way that may be attractive to the to the um, grant providers, is to phrase this in terms of how we may optimize learning or optimize the capacity of of our children. Singapore, like many other developing um, or developed countries, are faced with a um, uh, ever increasing proportion of, of older folks in, in society. Um, and uh, we are hit by a double whammy in that um, um, birth rate is very, very low. So um, much going, going forward, I think we really need to focus on optimizing what's left behind um, the, the few younger children that, that we have. Um, how do we do this? And we thought about um, several domain areas that we might want to, to focus, focus in. Um, per perhaps um, the one thing that is quite important is that in education, we're very keen on talking about understanding. Folks also talk about deeper understanding. But I'm not sure if I understand what understanding is. What do we mean when we say we really understand something? Is it just that we're flexible in solving different kind of problems? But that can be quite instrumental. When people talk about understanding in, in education in particular, there's this notion of conceptual understanding. You know, we have really deep engagement with a subject area um, that goes beyond the instrumental level. But what exactly is this, is this deep engagement, this deep conceptual we simply don't have a very good measure or handle on, on that area. Um, social and emotional skills is one area that is a um, um, uh, focus of the government. Um, executive functioning is something we've been working on. Understanding and usage of knowledge is something we have talked about this morning. Um, cultural nature of learning, creativity. Um, Singapore students are perceived as being very not creative. Um, there are advertisements to say that um, Singapore is, after all, quite creative. So we're trying to convince ourselves that we're not that bad. Um, um, but just the fact that we have advertisements suggests that you know, <laughs> we might need to do something about creativity. Um, so um, and we try to place these different domain areas into kind of different levels of, of investigation. And we came to the, um, uh, an initial um, suggestion that perhaps we don't need to look at everything down to the genetic level. Um, there are certain phenomena, certain domain levels that would really benefit from a much more thorough investigation at the genetic, neurological, cognitive, all the way up to the social level. So perhaps uh, one area is um, understanding, another area is perhaps the development of executive functioning. 
breath, um, if, we, if we look at something like the cultural dimension of learning, I don't know. I mean, may, maybe that's something that won't necessarily benefit from a uh, genetic level of, of investigation. But you know, there's something that, that we've um, put up there for, for further, sub, for further uh, uh, debate and uh, discussion. So I think um, in time I will end there. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry, for this very great introductory lecture into this whole conundrum here in Singapore. Now, if there are questions, please. Oh, again. Okay, ABC, okay, ABC, alphabetic order. Yeah. Very, very interesting, um, um, yeah, a, a different concept of working memory that I was talking about, but it's, it's very good, very applied. I just have a, a question on your working memory in terms of this training that you've been doing with the children. Yes. Uh, one is, um, uh, I guess you have a, a, a pretty small group, 30-something uh, per group, so it may be difficult, but I was just curious that, did you look at children who had lower working memory performance at the beginning? Mm. Did they get, did they do bigger gains than children who had an average? So, so I'm thinking more from the medical yeah. model. Yeah. So uh, does this training actually help those who had less at the beginning, or maybe a little bit borderline? Uh, or it doesn't. It's like if you're borderline, you're just borderline all along. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for asking that. That's an excellent question. Um, what we did, we, we've actually run it a couple of times already. The first time we ran it, we ran it with children who are in the learning support program. So these are children in primary one um, who at admission to, to the government schooling system have been found to have difficulty. Um, but in that study, when we gave our standardized t-test, what we found was that the kids in our sample were performing just fine on our standard, standardized test, and what they were having difficulty seeing was in English. Uh, and when we looked back at the status of these children, it turned out that a lot of them were from non-English speaking background, and also uh, uh, some of them were illegal immigrants. Um, in our second detail, we actually imposed a much more stringent in inclusion criterion, so we pre-tested them on um, working memory, um, updating capacity, as well as um, um, they had to be in either in the learning support program or were nominated by the teachers as, as being used into doing that. So we had a cutoff. I think it was um, they had to perform in the bottom one third of our <coughs> I see. So, so they were the uh, lower group to start off with. They were, they were in the lower so group. So we do not know then the range. We, we, looked at, we looked at the range as well. We used the pre-test measure mm -hmm. um, as a covariate to take into account. Okay. And the, the other, another question, just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you had a wonderful uh, cross-sectional longitudinal mm -hmm. group that you showed at the beginning where you collected a lot of the task data. Yes. I was wondering you could, and, and those are just healthy, normal kids in public schools. But yes, yes. So they, we, we started recruitment in, um, uh, for the kindergartens, we had s uh, six kindergartens locally, uh, literally <laughs> locally mm -hmm. around here, um, normally achieving kids, um, um, and then with the other cohorts from, from right. normal schools. So, so I'm just wondering, like you got all these database, is yeah. it? Uh, uh, possible to use them as normative data for well later each, on? Each age group has about um, 150 children. So um, we've published some of that, we've published some of that data already. Uh, so certainly I think, you know, it's, it's I'm not sure if it's nationally re representative, but it's, it's closely resembling a uh, national distribution. Um, 
Billy Fool, un expert euh, à l'extrême est intéressé. Je vais vous poser une question parce que je suis complètement ignorant de la zone. Ces enfants sont aussi suivis de l'école, de l'école school. Ils vont à l'école. And, and they have a professor of mathematics there. Yes. And they do math. Yes, they do. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what uh, fraction of, uh, of their time they spend in your test and in doing math at school? OK. So good question. <laughs> this, um, that was one of, our, one of our concerns as well. Um, we have actually had the primary one child coming up to testing and was crying at the end. Um, and when we asked why, uh, he said, well, I missed out on my math class. And I felt really quite bad, not so much in terms of kind of for the child, but that the system is, is such that the primary one child would, would be emotionally upset <laughs> for missing a class. Um, but for the intervention, for the intervention that was done in a uh, uh, last year, After the school, yeah. yeah. As a supplementary yes, because um, of course the the family context also, uh, as well as the school, is important. And and uh, in the list of the um, uh, larger context, you don't put uh, music and art. Right. Um, and uh, there is a big debate about uh, this issue. And uh, Obama has a program where he wants to introduce, uh, he's rediscovering the moon. But, uh, um, I think uh, this has been a long-standing question uh, that uh, several composers, have, uh, of music composers, have suggested that, uh, in fact, there was an improvement in math if you do some uh, right. musical training. So I don't, what is your position on this? Uh, maybe it's, I'm so, uh, sorry to ask this question because it's not really a, in the scientific context, but uh, maybe overall, do you find any, is there any scientific study about that? There, there, there are quite a few recent studies on um, <coughs> music in particular. Yes. I think there's even a journal on, on music and, um, and, the, yeah, and the data effects, basically. We, we because they discuss claim the data, are po is the result is positive, but I was wondering whether you have the same opinion. I, I haven't looked at it in detail, but I mean, from from the uh, brief look that I have, I think that there is some positive uh, aspect. Yes, I think this is, it's yeah. extremely difficult to make these kind of studies, of course, and, and they're usually a bias, uh, so that, uh, and also perhaps the good ones are uh, in mathematics are also doing music and so on. And so yeah. So yeah. I think it's important to differentiate between, um, kind of I think the kind of study you're mm -hmm. talking about, and um, I think back in the early 90s, there were talks about Mozart effect. Yes, yes, that's, yes, that's yes. quite different as well. We actually tried to replicate that study, um, but what we found was the Beethoven effect. <laughs> <Mozart's> effect. <laughs> so, um, but even in the original study, it was found that that um, effect was very constrained. Um, there was an improvement on the Beethoven cutting task on the Django Fine, and it lasted about 10 minutes. Or so. Mm -hmm. so you need to be quick. Listen to the music and just go cutting straight away. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, the, the well, this is uh, what I have. Uh, I had other questions. Very interesting studies. Um, so when I was listening to your presentation, um, uh, I was reminded of uh, Walter Michelle's study on delay of gratification. Mm -hmm. So one marshmallow versus you know several marshmallow, yep, and yep. the kid need to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, till the end, so that they, um, uh, he or she will get more marshmallow. Yeah. So that's a um, classic paradigm delay of gratification. And Walter was able to demonstrate that years later, 
um, this delay time was positively related to uh, SAT score. Yeah, so there is a um, academic performance, you know, uh, outcome benefit of this. So I, I'm wondering, you know, there are a lot of tests that you use, but um, are there any tests that capture this delay of gratification? And also, maybe the delay of gratification could be one of the mediator because if you can self-regulate, yeah. then you know you might be better off in many tasks, including math performance. Yeah. yeah. Excellent question. That's and that's something that we're looking at at the moment. Um, a colleague at NTU Psychology, Chu Li, has been um, looking at hot, what, what's called hot versus cold executive functioning tasks. Mm -hmm. So the delay of gratification task is often uh, uh, categorized as a hot EF task. Right. So it's a, it's a motivational right. and affective component. Right. Whereas something like what we've been using in terms mm -hmm. of Lanka, um, you know, Simon, or the classic group task, is often classified as cold EF. Mm -hmm. task. There's, there's no right, no right, right, there's right. No particular motivation. Mm -hmm. And um, there's only been quite recent studies mm -hmm. looking at hot versus cold mm -hmm. executive functioning mm -hmm. and the relation to academic performance. Right. And it has been found that the hot EF task do a quite, quite a good job. And right. perhaps from an ecological perspective, mm -hmm. it stands to reason because um, part of paying attention in class uh -huh. is not going to a break until you're right. allowed to. Mm -hmm. So it seems somewhat more similar mm -hmm. in context right. when, when we compare that to a delay of gratification. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. One comment to that. Mm. Um, so you divide it into hot versus cold. Yeah. And actually, Watcher, in one of his study, he turned the hot to cold. Yeah. Yes, by instructing the kid to think about the marshmallow as imagine it as um, just cloud in the sky. Yeah. So yeah. it's one cloud, and there are several clouds. So you do the mental representation, turning the hot, you know, yumminess of this marshmallow yeah. into something imaginary but cold. Yeah. 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 And he was able to um, demonstrate that by this intervention, the kid can wait longer. Right, right. And then in our own study, actually, we also did something back a long time ago in Hong Kong with kindergarten, um, right. kindergartner in Hong Kong. And one story, very cute, uh, a, uh, a young female um, child, she was able to wait really a long time. And then later on, we watched the uh, videotape of the whole section. And um, it's very interesting because when she, you know, at one moment, she seems like she wants to grab, you know, the bow. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, she drew back her uh, hand and then tried to find something. And later on, we, find that, uh, we saw that she find another plate. And um, she cover the marshmallow up, yeah. And that was, yeah, she generate this strategy spontaneously yeah, yeah. to help her, herself. So it's, v you know, it's very interesting, yeah, yeah, when I think back. the So there are individual difference in that to, to spontaneously come up with different strategies to delay, yeah. And that's what we're partially trying to sell, regulation. Exactly. It's, you know, real sense of the word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's something that we're looking at in a, in a um, study that's, that's underway. Mm -hmm. um, we're focusing on kindergarteners, mm -hmm. and we want to look at the experience they have mm -hmm. in kindergarten and at childcare centre, mm -hmm. and how that impacts right. on school regulation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're looking at um, is hot versus cold EF, mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at how that interacts right. with um, the experience that students have in kindergarten with the teachers right. and the quality of those yeah. interactions. I would love to, to, to have Very a look at your, your previous yeah. study on this as well. Thank you. So, Kumar? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think if you see the local syllabus of the mathematics, uh, till primary two, uh, it's all illustrative and then uh, direct numeracy. Uh, but suddenly, when it goes to primary three, uh, actually, it, it's more of English than uh, mathematics because there will be a lot of things will be written, and then there will be numeracy is very little. Uh, in Singapore, actually, the populations here, uh, most of them is not native English. Okay, uh, They have different languages. So when a child understands, okay, he has to trust, translate uh, in the mind 
to the local language and then to have to uh, give back the results in this uh, in English. Uh, but most of the child may not be uh, that much uh, uh, adaptive to the language uh, conversion or something like that. Uh, it may be appropriate that when it they come to uh, at the age of 10 or 11 or something like that, they can easily translate or something like that. So the, during the period of primary three to primary five, uh, there's a large gap, like three years gap, which they miss a lot of things, okay? These are the basics that you miss a lot. So your study evaluation started from primary one to secondary up to that one. So sometimes maybe the primary one to two, the numeracy, the student might have scored well. At the primary three, primary four, they might have failed, okay? And uh, uh, do you have any comment about this? Something like that. Um, that's, that's it. I think different components to, to your comments. So let me take, take um, my understanding of them. Um, one, one is that um, we, we did a lot of student studies precisely for that reason. Because the cross-sectional set, set of data really doesn't tell you how an individual improves across time. Whereas with a true longitudinal study, it allows us to track and also see growth curve onto how children progress across several years. Uh, and allow us to answer quite a different set of questions as compared to cross-sectional data. Um, as to the English competency, that is a very important issue. And in um, just about all of our studies, not only have we taken, I, I didn't mention it today, but not only did we take measures of, of numeracy and mathematical competency, we also uh, uh, took measures of comprehension as well as vocabulary um, performance nothing else just to allow us to vary out the contribution of uh, language com competency on mathematical performance. So very good points and uh, language competency certainly is a, an important question. Uh, but what if, stud if your study is in the local language? Mm -hmm. So for example, if a Chinese, you, you give them, uh, no need to give them in a Chinese or something like that, but you can explain them in Chinese, ask them to write uh, what what is the answer for it, and then if it's Malay, Malay, just, yeah. and then uh, for Indian languages for Indian. Well, with, okay. with all of our all of our studies we conducted in in English, testing was in English, uh, largely because that's how school is done, and also mathematics is taught in English as well. Mm, yeah, it's true, but uh, maybe there may be a different results actually if it is in a local language. Okay. Uh, Kerry, uh, one quick question yep. to for uh, clarification and then uh, a longer sort of comment. The quick question, um, when you say longitudinal, you are not talking about the same cohort of students, right? These are the same children, yeah. So you track them all the way to secondary level? Well, we, had, we started off with four cohorts. Okay. Um, but for each cohort, we tracked them for four years. So including the, the, in the, the, the P1? So the, we started off with, um, uh, let's say, the P2 cohort. Okay. We tested them at P2, P3, P4, and P5 each, right? So K2 would be K2, P1, P2, P3. And okay. then we did, we did equivalent testing on the overlapping age group. Um, and when the variance was, was found to be uh, reasonable, then we collapsed across the age group. So earlier when you showed us the, 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 the kindergarten findings, uh, the primary and the secondary, yes. uh, that's actually three different groups. Right, because y your your longitudinal is actually within the within the primary, within the secondary, within the kindergarten, rather than across all three segments. Is that correct? Um, in terms of the data collection, yes. But because we did the equivalent testing on the overlapping age group, you see, with the four cohorts, each cohort overlaps with the next cohort by um, two age groups. So we have K K two. P1, P2, P3, right? Okay. And the next cohort started at P2. So the P2 and the P3 are tested twice. Okay. And then we tested the characteristics of the two cohorts of P2 and P3 to make sure they that they are uh, equivalent. 
and they were statistically equivalent. Then we collect data and ran our, our longitudinal test on the collection. Okay. Uh, then my comment. Um, the issue of uh, transferability, uh, transferability of, of the working memory, um, did you consider the domain, the subject domain specific specificity? Um, because, for example, just now when you were taking us through, you know, the the, 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 the cognitive process of you know handling the the mathematical um, uh, calculation, uh, the kind of working memory that is involved is very different from a different subject area. Like, for example, in music, we also need working memory depending on what kind of music activity you're involved in, and it's a very very different nature. Uh, and so the games that, that you, got your, you got your children to play develop certain kinds of working memory, but it has limited application to you know, when it comes to specific subject. And so maybe that's the reason why the transferability was limited. Um, I think here we need to clearly differentiate between short-term memory and working memory, or the executive components of working memory. So there is quite clear evidence to, to suggest that at the short-term memory level, the main specificity um, is quite real. So visual spatial versus phonological memory storage um, are, have been found to be separate, and the kind of complexity um, have been found to be perhaps different as well. But it's a bit diff difficult to compare for spatial memory versus phonological memory. Uh, like phonological memory, you can measure in terms of one bit, two bit, three bits of information, whereas when you have spatial information, probably a bit more difficult to categorize in terms of that kind of, of unit. Um, at least what the data have shown so far is that at the, at the central executive level, um, capacity is a motor. So it doesn't matter whether it's visual spatial or phonological. Although there has been some recent debate as to whether the, um, the previous findings from this uh, you know, previous conclusion that it is a motor. So there has been some kind of recent revisiting of that issue, but by and large, um, um, the, the current understanding is that at that central executive executive level, um, capacity is very Thank you. Okay. Yeah, my question is kind of related to working memory concern. So I think for the different math sub, uh, subjects like numeracy, arithmetic, uh, geometry, and algebra and calculus, it seems to me it's not working memory uh, behind it. It's actually uh, the logical reasoning or inferences uh, behind it. So that basically um, what I mean is we cannot measure it or associate it with working memory. We have to find the subjects, the kids, whether they can make reasoning, like give them a story and ask them what's the reason behind the finding, like give an evidence and a conclusion or, you know, there is an inference between the two and can they make the inference between the two? So that means they know how to bridge the connection between the them. Um, that basically <laughs> was from my own experience because math was my, f uh, yeah, is my favorite subject, but I think, um, Doing math problem is basically like you walk um, some kind of path, you know, each step has a foundation. So you have to make sure this step is accurate or correct based on previous findings or rules. So every step is backed up by a rule. And um, that's how reasoning works. And that's different from working memory or long-term memory, anything related to memory. So we had a colleague, a friend, so he transferred from uh, biological science to mathematics. The reason of that, he said, biological science is just uh, memory. He thinks it's not challenging enough. He wants something more challenging, like a reasoning inference. Although I, I think that time, maybe that was his <laughs> interpretation. Now I think biological science, probably it has a reasoning, but um, it just, it takes a longer step because for us, we got trained in math from a nursery or kindergarten. But um, for biological science, we get at a later, um, maybe, um, yeah, um, high school, we get trained. So we have to build the facts uh, early until like uh, college, then we can make reasoning. So, but before we get the reasoning stage, he just get tired of all the memory um, about the details of the biological science. So I think um, the association between um, math and work memory is not as strong as um, math with logical reasoning. 
So um, can you design some tasks to <laughs> measure them? Let, let, let me just respond to that thing. Um, um, there has been a large number of studies that looked at the reasoning um, and the measurement. So by reasoning, if we define that in terms of theory, Two constants are equivalent. Right. Um, it was found that it was conceded that you know, they're not. Um, and in terms of pre predicting to criterion measures, such as reading comprehension and, and math performance, um, these working memory measures tend to do a little bit better. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so with, with our studies, uh, earlier studies in particular, we always measured field intelligence as well as working memory capacity. Yeah. And what we found was that when we regressed out Right. Um, the explanatory power of, of um, intelligence, yes. working memory, still contributed some I see. So I'm trying to say, get rid of the working memory thing and just uh, focus on the reasoning and inference part with the math performance. I think Would that be possible? I think if that's, if that's the case, we'll be losing out some of the explanatory power. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that the working memory measures did better than the reasoning uh, oh. measures, at, at, at least in terms of Mm -hmm. uh, reasoning as fluid intelligence. I see. Um, but what you were saying, uh, so that's that's one definition of, of reasoning as as fluid intelligence. Yeah. When we talk about reasoning, I think when you started off, um, you were talking about reasoning in terms of dependency mm -hmm. yeah. of calculus and algebra. Right. Um, um, so we, we usually understand that more in terms of domain specific knowledge. Mm -hmm. And certainly but with our longitudinal data, that's true too to what you yeah. In that, when we got to our older children, mm -hmm. what we found was that the working memory measures failed to predict performance one year later, um, oh. as well as as compared to to domain specific measures. So when we look at our auto regressive model, yeah. what we found with the older kids um, was that performance was very much dependent on how mm -hmm. they did the year before, which is consistent to, with what you're suggesting. Right. So with calculus. They really have to be able to. They build upon the yeah. The it's right. built upon the previous knowledge and the rules learned earlier. Right. And for those older kids, performance is much less mm -hmm. dependent on working memory or operating capacity. Right. But the reverse seems to be true for the younger mm -hmm. children. I see. Uh, okay. So about work memory, uh, back to Indy's point about delayed gratification. So what about? Uh, how about the focus? Like if they are paying attention to the task and they can focus on the task, um, you know, very um, for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> if they can focus on the task for 45 minutes or the examination period, then they can do the <laughs> do the exam well, right? Compared to the ADHD subjects, the kids with ADHD, so um, it's not like they're not smart enough. They just cannot pay attention for that long period of time, so they didn't do well. So that there are. There have been studies done with working memory on uh, children with special needs, and um, I think what you're suggesting is, is, is correct in that um, executive functioning has been found to be a, a large component of, of ADHD in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a developing area, and what we find problematic with um, many previous studies is that they tend to use single measures of, of, um, of these constructs. Mm -hmm. um, Inhibition, in particular, is quite tricky to measure. Uh, I think during the break we talked about the group task, and uh, yes. when we use different versions of group, like a uh, color, traditional color words group versus a numeric group task, typically we find that those different versions are very poorly correlated. And there's a really very little reason why they should be, because from a paradigm level, they're exactly the same. It's just in a single line of decision. So mm. it worries us a bit that something is so well established, uh, are quite poorly correlated. I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. You Thanks. Work with Dante, uh, because we are on that front of the study at the front of the case, so that we can say that there is uh, a lot of uh, social issue uh, on the education of the student. I'm asking this question, which is uh, unfortunately not very scientific, but uh, many of our children are using uh, electronic device. 
uh, like uh, Game Boys or uh, all these things for hours and really became addicted to um, these, uh, these uh, uh, device. Um, and the question is, uh, is it beneficial uh, to Matt, for instance, or not? Because um, it's, uh, it's becoming a plague now in, uh, in our societies to, I see that with my young child, uh, <laughs> who has uh, fortunately uh, abandoned the, the uh, this kind of device at uh, an early age, but he, he was spending really hours. And when you do these experiments where uh, you spend maybe uh, few hours per, per, per week, they, they, s they spend tens of hours doing this. So yeah. how do you uh, view, <laughs> I'm sorry to ask this uh, trivial yeah. question, but uh, for, for the parents, it's uh, grandparents, it's a very important question. That's, that's a very good question, and it's a question that I, I deal with at home as well. So when my child played Call of Duty, I, I asked him to, to promise me that he would join the Special Forces later on, because that's what he's training for. Um, and with the, with the fighter jet games, he needs to be a pilot, uh, fighter pilot. But, um, <laughs> but there has been very few studies to, to look at those games in particular. There are some studies. I think what um, some of the studies found was that with the fast reaction games, not surprisingly, awareness of, of uh, peripheral stimuli. Um, but I think there may well be some kind of multitasking benefits as well. But um, the last time I looked at it, there were really just a handful of experimental studies or, or even correlational studies that looked specifically at how amounts of gameplay correlate with positive outcomes. Um, yeah, that's just reading it on the plane on the way over. <laughs> Not not many, not many studies so far. Um, so I think the amount of time spent on these games is important uh, relative to relative to other things. So you know they're only twenty four hours in a day. If you're spending ten hours, you're just not spending that much time doing other things. So it's a matter of balance. This aspect is detrimental. This aspect is detrimental, but maybe it has some well. I think the data is not completely in yet, but I mean some of it. Some of it is uh, is similar to the debate about TV. Um, and I think there are some some very good data on TV and cognitive outcomes now, uh, especially recent data. So I think that will generalize because at the end of the day, you're still sitting down, you're watching a screen, you're moving your hand, so it's not as you're not as as um, tempted as just watching television. But in terms of physical activity. I thank you, Kerry, thank for you. this excellent discussion and talk. I think we have to thank you.